You're listening to Let's Talk About Fatherlessness with host Sean Tice, where we talk about leading fatherless families to the Heavenly Father. Hey, welcome back to Let's Talk About Fatherlessness. Today, I have a special guest named Brian Johnson from Psalm 68 Five Camps. Welcome on our show, Brian. Hey, glad to be here. Thank you. Great, great to have you. Would you go ahead and take a few moments to tell us about your ministry and organization? Sure. Um, the, the ministry is called Psalm 68 Five Ministries. Started in uh, as a 501c3 in uh, 2015. And it's obviously, you know, and but uh, everybody probably on your podcast will know or find out that Psalm 68 Five is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, his God in his holy dwelling. And that's a promise King David was inspired to share about uh, our relationship with his heavenly father and his special place in his heart for us when we're growing up without a dad. So our uh, our vision is to you know to serve the fatherless in their uh, trouble and and uh, where they're at with a mission being that um, we provide scholarships for fatherless kids to attend summer camp and at special camps that we partner with who have a heart for the fatherless to to collect and uh, create and uh, share ministry resources that's specific to uh, and intentional to serving the fatherless. And then finally, encouraging camps and other Christian partners like yourself in in your um, calling to support the fatherless, however that, uh, that may occur. That's wonderful, and and we're excited to be part of uh, you guys' camp this summer, um, to, to be part of one of the weeks that you guys offer, and uh, looking forward to that, being the camp camp pastor of that. Uh, the reason why, why you had them on the show, because obviously your organization goes along with fatherlessness. I mean, it, it, it is a national epidemic, and you're addressing a need where these kids, these moms, they need to go, go to a place um, and kind of get away and right. really experience uh, God. I know as a teenager and just, you know, seventh grade is where I went to camp for the first time, went to the wilds of North Carolina. And uh, that was, that changed my life. I mean, going there, being apart from, apart from TV, friends, influences for a whole week in, right. in a cabin, being in sessions, that was, that changed my life, uh, made assurance of my salvation there. And so I can't, you know, speak more highly of going to camp and being involved in that. Obviously, as a single mom, if you're watching this, make sure it's a safe place that you trust and you believe it's a good place for your kids. Um, but I I went with my youth group, with my church, and we had just an amazing time um, during that week. Then each year we would rotate. Almost every year we would go to a youth conference, then we go to camp the next year. But that was something we did every year. And I also served as a, a counselor there. So such a great, uh, I served as a counselor for a youth, a junior camp that we our church used to host. Um, and that was a great experience too, because I got to serve, I got to serve the kids and, and be part of that. So camp is just, a, it's, it's an amazing opportunity for, for kids and teenagers. Um, and again, make sure that you think it's a right, safe place. If you're a single mom, it's a place that you, you trust the leaders and things like that, but it can be a life changing thing for them. So I appreciate what you do with that. And I love how you focus on helping the fodless get to there. Uh, can you speak a little more to that and also your background on how you got involved in this ministry? Right. Well, um, so taking the second question first, my background, uh, I grew up fatherless. I, uh, when I was about, well, when I was three years old, my father left, he was in the military and went to Vietnam. Uh, and when I was four years old, he became missing in action in Vietnam. Wow. And so, as a family, we thought he was, must be a prisoner of war. The helicopter went down, everybody on the helicopter died except for him. And his body was never recovered. And, um, but they didn't share a lot of information back in those. That was like mid 60s. And a lot of information wasn't shared back then. So we just waited. We just waited to hear word. You know, surely we're going to hear something soon. But yeah. in weeks turned into months, turned into years, really. And it wasn't until the end of near the end of the war when the POWs came back that we found out that he wasn't among those POWs, prisoners of war, coming back from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I was, so I was four when he became missing, three when he left, and then about 12 when we 
you know, he didn't come back with the POWs. And we still didn't give up hope that maybe he wasn't somewhere, maybe they kept some POWs, or maybe he was in Laos. Or, um, but uh, about three years later, when I was about 15, uh, we there was some sharing of information, and it came pretty conclusive, almost, you know, I'd say 98% conclusive, that he probably died that day way back when I was four years old. We just didn't know it. So, um, and then he was finally declared killed in action or presumed dead when I was 17. And uh, so I kind of had all of those years without a dad around, without, uh, you know, the chance to mourn the loss and um, kind of resolve it. It was just kind of limbo is what we called it. And um, I had an older brother, younger sister. And, uh, you know, there were, Seeds planted in our lives during that time. Uh, I remember at an Awana meeting, you know, they everybody was trying to always figure out whose kids we were. You know, we maybe we were a little awkward and didn't know how to interact as much with kids because of our situation. But um, you know, somebody, hey, now who's your, who's your dad? You know, and uh, well, you know, he's missing in action in Vietnam. We we'd said that many times over the years. And mo no, normally people say, oh, I'm sorry, and kind of awkwardly walk away. But somebody said something to the effect of, hey, do you know that God has a special place in his heart for kids when they're growing up without their dad? Mm -hmm. I now realize that was a paraphrase of Psalm 68.5, right? Yeah. But, but back then I didn't know. And it was probably 20 years after that that I actually, wow, hey, here's the scripture. Now, nobody, it's interesting, nobody pointed out that there's all these scriptures, over 40 scriptures that reveal God's heart for the fatherless. And, uh, and you know, it's, and I, I, so I like what you're doing, and I appreciate it so much, because it's important that kids know that God has a special place in his heart for them when they're growing up without a dad around. And, uh, and that's, uh, as opposed to, like, avoiding the subject, because it may be you know, hurtful or something. I think uh, I think it's important to to share share that. Yeah, the president yeah. of my college said a similar thing to me when I was in college. He said that he believed that there's a little extra grace. The guy gives a little extra grace to those that are uh, growing up fatherless, and it's very similar. He didn't use the scripture, I don't think, but he yeah. he said that to me, and that that really impacted me when I was in college because I'm like, wow, that's. Um, that's powerful. And just to be able to have those words of affirmation, words of encouragement to come to us when we're growing up without a dad, uh, it's an amazing thing. Now, now your story is um, incredible. You, How did that impact you? I mean, we'll come back to to how you got into uh, right. the, the ministry, Psalm 68, five ministries, but how did that impact your life? I mean, waiting, waiting like that. What, can you speak more about that? Well, so I really, I didn't know any different that, you know, okay, you know, we don't cognitively think so much about all those things. I do know that we all had to kind of build walls around of our emotion. We couldn't think of a father that maybe was tortured in a POW camp or in some bamboo cage somewhere. Uh, we all remember there was a parade going by one time with POWMI, and there was a guy in a bamboo cage that was part of the parade on this, you know, I don't know if it was a Memorial Day or Fourth of July some. And uh, and that like shocked us to think, oh man, uh, could our dad be like that? So we we had to we had to put up walls around that, and but all that uncertainty, all of that emotion, um, back then in the '60s and '70s, we didn't really go meet with somebody to talk these things out as kids, right? We just um, we just kind of dealt with it. But I. I call it like it was spaghetti inside, you know, and it wants to come out. So it's, at some point it's going to come out. And and we all had to, in our own ways, you know, deal with that to try to, okay, you know, we need to like um, to deal with that, all that unresolved sadness, you know, to grieve it, to, um, to process it. And, um, you know, honestly, uh there was a lot of emotional pain and you know and all kids are different and they deal with pain differently but uh pain can can morph to anger it can uh 
it, there can be some that I just want to get out of this pain and they're looking for any kind of, um, you know, uh, way to get out of that emotional pain. Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's, you know, other, there's other things we all know about. And, and so, um, I think that, uh, to differing degrees, we went through, through that phase, you know, especially, especially because all of this, you know, him not coming back and declared build in action all happened around the time we were, you know, those teen years where, um, where there's a uh, kind of vulnerability there in that regard. So, um, so it, it, we kind of, uh, worked through that. I would say we, that we worked through a lot of that pain, that uncertainty, and, um, we had a, a really strong grandmother who had faith and she, we call her kind of the spiritual matriarch of the family that she was a rock. That was my father's mother, actually. Um, we we knew that our dad was a Christian. He went to Wheaton College, and we knew that he had a strong faith, even though he died at 27 years old. You know, that was kind of a that was a positive legacy for us to um, to uh, pursue a faith. And um, you know, my brother, you know, he. He was the oldest, and he uh, he he suffered. You know, I, I listened to one of your podcasts. And you're you're now the man of the family. Well, you know, at 13 years old, it's like it's a, it could be really unfair to to kids, right? To say, hey, you're the you're supposed to act in all these ways, and do it puts a lot of pressure on them. And yeah. and uh, so, um, you know, he he struggled quite a bit. You know, moved out of the house. He was 17. And we were glad that he was gone because it was so disruptive and what was going on and all the dysfunction there. But um, but you know what? He came back around. He he checked himself into drug and alcohol rehab center. He's now been sober for over 35 years. He has a beautiful family, five kids. They're all believers. He's he's you know, he's uh the, the chairman of the board of one of the camps that this camp that you'll be coming to. So uh, it's been a, it's been a journey, but God's, you know, worked through that in our, in our lives to, uh, um, that, that we all have faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and savior. And because of that, he gives us the right to become children of God and that we, as his children, as our Abba father, now we can crawl on his lap. Even at 62 years old, I still crawl up and you know, ask for Jesus to be present, the Holy Spirit to be there when I s spend time in scripture. Um, and uh, so it's uh, kind of a roundabout way to get there. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't just a linear path. And, and I, I don't want to talk too much, but um, I think for fatherless Kids, there's a tendency that even though we accept Christ, there's a times in our life when we accept Christ, we still think, okay, now I've got to go out and be a good Christian. I've got to go, you know, this this idea that God now loves me unconditionally, and this Father in heaven loves me unconditionally. Whenever ne I've never experienced that in life at all. I have no, you know, maybe some kids would say, yeah, that's an easy step for me to take because my father is so loving, right? He just cares for me, responds that way. I can, I can, that's not a, a problem. But so for me, it seems like I spent a lot of time in a little bit of wilderness trying to earn my father, you know, trying to earn my way into his presence to get myself better, to be a better Christian, to spend more time in the word, all these things, you know, when, when in really a reality, that was like, me not taking on Christ's righteousness, but just trying to clean myself up. I call the self-wash cycle. And so then I would try to rededicate myself or, you know, and well, maybe it didn't take the first time. All those thoughts would go through my head. And it, um, but what a blessing it was when I finally realized, hey, it's only because of Christ's righteousness that I have that, that I can, be in the presence of the, my 
Abba Father, and um, and you know just have that unconditional love from Him. And uh, so, so that's you know that's just another thing that uh, I don't know if there's a propensity of that for fatherless kids. I think it, there may be. It, you know, it happened in my life, but um, I wish I wish somebody had come into my life at a younger age to help me process that and understand that that uh, exchange that I'm I'm really wearing Christ's righteousness as opposed to, hey, now go be a good Christian and get your act together and and then maybe it'll all work out. So um it's embracing God as as your dad through Jesus Christ. And that's what yeah. we that's what we preach. How old were you whenever you finally were like, I really have peace about this. I mean, how long did it take you? So, uh, so I mean obviously I think so, I think it's a lifelong process. Right? It, 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 right, it is. But, but I mean, where was there a point where it was like, I, I really embrace this? I mean. When, when I felt like, warts and all, I could go really crawl up on my Abba Father's lap and feel his loving arms around me and um, and, and tell me about, you know, that, hey, listen to my son Jesus, you know, in, in scriptures. He's there for you. Um that was probably, I would say, in my 40s at some point. With that, yeah. really, I mean, I was a believer way before then. I was, uh, you know, since I've been married, I've been active in church, elders and all that type of thing. But there was still this. Um, Performance. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there, there's this, I think there's this thing where, it, you know, when you have a dad, you have this time of development with that dad. But. When we don't have that. We always say that our life is off balance, and and I think people that have never experienced it, they they think they just 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 get over it. You know, God redeems it. Get over it, and and God does redeem it. But there is this side of it where we have this twisted view of God, where we have to either perform, or we have to that God's going to leave us, or you know, there's so many things that we whether your dad passed away, whether he walked away. There's so many layers to it. And yeah. I appreciate you saying that because it helps people understand that it's not just one of these things where it's like, okay, you were fatherless, get over it, move on with your life. It, and it's not like we're trying to be a victim about it, but it just takes right. time yeah. to to embrace God fully as your heavenly Father. And I think it's sometimes a lifelong thing. We've come across people all over the nation where they, you know, they're older and they're just like, I'm still working through this. Right. Um, they'll ask us about our devotionals for you know teenagers and young adults, and they'll, they'll want to use them. Um, for themselves, which, hey, that's fine. Um, but they're just trying yes. to work through that, right? Yes, absolutely. And I think, and, and you may share this with me also, in that uh, even though that, you know, that roads and journeys kind of, uh, that pilgrim's progress, if you will, is, you know, you get stuck in the mud for a season or, you know, whatever. You take, a, it seems like a shortcut, and then you have to go back to the path and continue forward. Um, God incredibly redeems it, you know, because of going through that process, you and I can now uh, sit down with a fatherless kid and know what's kind of churning inside of them and share the hope that we have through Jesus Christ, you know, to be that son or daughter of uh, the true father. And that, and that, that maybe that we wouldn't have that uh situation or that we wouldn't be in a situation we are had we not gone through that process and god allowed it to happen so that we can come alongside there it's kind of like hey it, it redeems those years you know and uh, it gives them meaning because we are we can be um active in serving the lord in in our brokenness in in the areas where we were broken yeah that's so true and and it helps us um as we work through it and we cling to God, I love how you said that you, you just go and curl up with your Abba father and, and, and embrace that and spend time with him. Now you must've had, you said your grandma, what, what was it like for your mom during this time? I mean, she obviously waiting for her husband thinking maybe that he, maybe he could come back. Was she thinking that? Or was she like, I know he's probably gone. What was, what was it like no, with your mom uh, sharing? She, she had strong faith that he was coming back. And, um, she, we remember this. I know in my heart that Bruce is coming back. You know that that was my father's thing. Um, for whatever reason, she felt that that he would come back 
to the family. And, and honestly, I don't see how it could, you know, I can't even imagine the idea that, okay, he's missing an action. He may be a POW that we would ever consider maybe giving up on that. Yeah. Um, it was just, you know, we just, it was like, okay, I wonder where he's a POW at. It's, um, and, and even after we found out that he wasn't coming back, that he most likely died that day, we didn't talk about it. It was because like, you go through almost, you know, 10 years or more of believing this and hoping this, um, it, it's like, it's just, uh, it takes, you just can't switch on a dime. You, you have to go through it. I remember riding in the car with my grandmother in Michigan one time. And, um, she said to me, and this was after we pretty well knew, she said, um, Brian, I hope your mother gets remarried. And I remember being shocked. I'm like, damn, how could you, you know, what do you mean? You know? Um, but, you know, she had processed that she realized that her son was not coming back and that our family needed to kind of move on with life rather than just being on hold. I mean, my mother, she'd wonder whether, oh, what's your dad going to say when he finds out I bought this sofa, you know, for the house? You know, all these decisions that she's making unilaterally, thinking that, you know, uh, trying to keep my dad's wishes in how how she would you know, raise the family in that circumstance. That's interesting. Now, shifting gears over to Psalm 68, five ministries, how, how did that happen? I mean, where did you, were you, was there a group of people that started it? I mean, you said your brother was a part of a camp. Was he part of it as well? Tell us uh, more about that. Okay. And tell us about the ministry too. Right. So, um, so for whatever reasons, God has blessed the business world that I was in, you know, starting with, um, I was, my career was in Houston, Texas, and it was in the oil and gas industry and um, in a real niche kind of business. And um, I was given the opportunity to do like a management buyout of the first company I worked for with some partners. And that worked out well. And a company bought that one. I started a new business and that company, the timing was just right, you know, and for whatever reason, I, I did feel like God gave me some favor with, with men in business situations and things. And um, so that went well and sold that business in 2010. And um, and even previous to that, we as a family were sending fatherless giving kids uh, scholarships to a camp for fatherless kids to come to that camp. But then we tithed um, the sale of business to, you know, set that aside in a fund to send fatherless kids to camp. And we thought it'd be like a um, hundred kids a year for 10 years or something like that. And thought, okay, that's, you know, it's a good way to tie that. And, um, but this company that we sold to, they were, you know, I, I did my, I had to, I'd worked like three or four years with them after we sold the business as part of the contract. But when that was done, I'm like, hey, I'm going to move on. I'm going to be more involved in, in ministry activities and different things. And um, they asked me to get in front of their the whole kind of group of companies that they had. The private equities was kind of a portfolio of people in, in certain businesses. And um, so I just they said, can you share what you're going to do? You know, and you know maybe they wanted to make let everybody know we didn't have a falling out or anything. I was just kind of moving on. Well, I shared about serving fatherless, helping send fatherless kids to summer camp and a little of the statistics. I probably only talked for about five or seven minutes. And um, God, uh, well, when I, was, when I was done, I went out in the hallway and people had written checks to say, hey, I want to send fatherless kids with, you know, I like what you're planning to do. Here's some checks. Well, I didn't have a 501c3, so I couldn't give them a tax receipt. But I found out if I set up, 501c3 by the end of the year, I could give them a tax receipt. And then other people, um, you know, were like, hey, what am I wonder what I'm going to do as my career kind of slows down and all that. Hey, I'm Brian, I like what you're doing and and uh, what God's calling you to do. Do you have any need for help on that? 
And so people started coming on and joining with me, very organic kind of uh, growth. And, uh, and we were, you know, mainly about, um, mainly about just sending fatherless kids, almost like a little foundation as opposed to, you know, we don't run a camp. We don't, you know, we support camps that, that do that. Uh, but then as we're working with the camps, and you've probably done this yourself, if you do a Google search on Christian resources for the fatherless, you know, for work with the fatherless, it's hardly anything out there. It's amazing in Christendom how little there is. So by you putting books to, you know, out and things like that, that's like, uh, that's needed for for uh, Christendom, I think. And so, um, so like, hey, how can we start gathering these and sharing these with the camps themselves, you know, where those fatherless kids are, where their wounds are, and kind of help help uh, address some of those things. Um, and so that's, so that's how the, uh, the ministry evolved a little bit to, uh, to include resources and then encouraging others called to serve the fatherless. That's wonderful. Um, that's such a, such a great ministry. How long have you been doing it for? How long did you say? So, um, so we, we started working at camps and things around 2010, maybe okay. 20, 2009. We were been going to these camps for quite a while, but then uh, the ministry, the 513C was set up in 2015, so about eight years ago. Wow, okay. And now if if there's a, um, a, a like a mom that wants to enroll her kid, how would they, how do they do that? What's the process on that? Right. So, well, we, we work with about 20 different camps now. So, uh, and we, this year we'll do about 700 fatherless scholarships. So we've kind of gone wow. beyond that, which is praise God for that. And, um, but it's, it's really, um, if they go to one of the camps that we work with in, across the U S and say, Hey, I'd like to send my kid to, um, camp or like, we now have four single mom family camps at one of the camps up in Northern Michigan that uh, I'm particularly active with. And so this is gives a chance for moms to go unpack. You know, absolutely nobody's going to judge them on, you know, if there's dysfunction in their family, it's like the moms build community with the other moms and we get them and we have the kids doing all these activities and we keep them, uh, you know, so that the moms don't have to worry, oh, are my, are my kids okay? You know, they're, they're like, they see the love there. They see how safe it is. They see, um, and, and nobody's nobody's judging them on what's going on in their life at all. We're just there to love on them. And then once they see, wow, this is a pretty safe place. Yes, I'm comfortable now sending my son or daughter to their age group camp, you know, during the rest of the summer. So that's, that's how it happens a lot. But um, if they would just contact uh, one of those camps and i can get you that that list um of the camps that we partner with uh, angel tree is somebody we also work with angel tree camping they're part of prison fellowship yeah. and they have a lot more camps than we do so if a parent is incarcerated uh or they have an incarcerated parent um there's a lot more scholarship opportunities for those kids who are um, you know don't maybe have the father in the home because of incarceration and we can uh we can share that information with you too. Wow. Okay. Well, what's the what's the future of Psalm sixty eight five ministries? Do you have any any things you're working on? Any projects or things you're doing? Uh, or are you just? I mean, obviously, what you're doing is amazing. I'm not trying to belittle. I'm just saying it's a right. project. Yeah. So right now we um, we do have a like a, a week long prayer journal, and um, where the kids are. Uh, to enter into their story with a mentor. And we ask camps to try to do a one-on-one -on -one mentoring, you know, at the camp where they'll spend 30 minutes a day going through. But there's different scriptures like, um, uh, well, I, I won't go into all, but scriptures that were like hugely impactful to me. Luke 15, 20, he arose to return to his father while he was still a long way away. His father saw him and filled compassion for his son. He ran to his son and and kissed him. That's you know, a picture of our heavenly father when we you know, turn to come to him. And that's, that's the character of the father. He loves us. And he's not, I would have thought as a young kid, he'd be kind of the stern, there you go again, mess up again. Right. But, but that's not how he is. So we try to help change that paradigm for kids. Of, this is how Jesus describes what the heavenly father is like. 
James, John 1, 12, 13, uh, we do the, through the gospel message, you know, John 3, 16 and 3, 17, um, and uh, just other scriptures that these kids would go through. Kind of similar to your book, but, you know, condensed to a five or six days at camp. That's great. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and so I, I think it's amazing what you guys are doing. Um, I just, I love how you're, you're helping kids go to camp and, and even single moms. I mean, just helping them get, get, I, I you talk when you were talking about, you're describing and I'm picturing, this sounds like something my mom would have signed up for. And she would have loved to have had a community of single moms going to a camp. She would have been able to send us to activities and be able to fellowship. I, I think it's wonderful. Um, and so, and, and the fact that, I love how you shared the story where you were do, successful in business and you knew that God wanted you to go and that faithfulness that you had where you're like, Hey, I'm going to go. And then look what God did where he had these business people just giving you checks and jumping on board. And that, that's a God story that, and that shows, that's an example for people that are listening saying, if you're, if you're, if you're on the fence, if you're hesitant about getting involved and in doing something for fatherless ministry, God loves the fatherless. He's a father to the fatherless. He says it's pure religion. It's pure religion for us to, to visit the fatherless when there's an affliction, to keep uh, keep ourselves in spite of the world. If we do it, God will bless it. And he, he will. I mean, I'm not you know, preaching prosperity gospel or anything like that, but yeah. I'm saying that God, if God truly has called you to reach the fatherless, he will provide for you. And Brian, your story is, is a testimony to that, how you were in front of business people. And normally you'd think that they would be just get out of here, forget it. But they were like, Hey, we're going to help um, with what you're doing. And so I, I thank you for sharing that testimony. Thank you for sharing the testimony of, of your childhood. Um, such great stories. That's what I love about the show is when I get on with individuals, just the things that come out and the things that we, we find out about people and how God's worked in their life or how, what God's using in the ministry. Um, we, we have about two minutes left. Would you just share how to find you, um, how people can connect with your ministry if they're a pastor or even as a, a fatherless individual family or a ministry leader? Yes. Well, our, our website is uh, www.psalm, P-S-A-L-M, and then the number six and the number eight, and then F-I-V-E, so five, dot org. And... Um, and we'll we have a we'll have a list of camps that we'll be uh, sponsoring this summer. So if those are in your area as a single mom and you'd like to uh, find out more, you can you can uh, go there and, and check that out. Uh, you can email us. We'll we um, we do have resources that, that we provide free of charge, um, and uh, so we're we're happy to share any kind of resources that we collect. You know, not not many of them are the ones that we produce, but but people like Life Factors Ministry, we um, we appreciate all the, the resources that you guys are putting out. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, my e- email address, if anybody wanted to, I'll, I'll put that out there. It's Brian B R Y A N dot Johnson at Psalm six eight f i v e dot org. And I'm happy to uh, talk to anybody about um, serving the fatherless or, um, you know, the hope that I have having grown up fatherless and uh, and finding that true father through Jesus Christ. Well, thank you, Brian, for being on. And we look forward to connecting with you further at camp this summer. And this will air after that. We'll be able to promote for the next next year's camps. But thanks so much for being on with us today. Okay, thank you. To learn more about how you can get involved in fatherless family ministry, visit lifefactors.org where you can find some free resources. You can find our books that we have. You can find some, even the program that we have to help you start a single mom ministry within your ministry or within your church. We can all work together to lead fatherless families to the Heavenly Father.